The nation's first black president joining a crowd of thousands in Selma, Alabama this weekend to mark 50 years since Bloody Sunday when state troopers attacked marchers seeking voting rights for all. President Obama said the struggle for equality continues. We just need to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to know that this nation's racial history still casts its long shadow upon us. We know the march is not yet over. We know the race is not yet won. And indeed, all this the same week the Justice Department issued a blistering report about racial bias in the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department. And we're back now with a panel. Before we get to the larger issue of race in America, I, I just want to note that the Justice Department cleared Ferguson Police Officer Darren Wilson of any wrongdoing in the shooting death of Micah Brown, just as the Missouri grand jury did, George, after seven months of investigations and protests, it turns out that hands up, don't shoot, apparently never happened. No, but it did, it was convenient because it was congruent with a liberal interpretation of things. And it's the third time we've seen this. It began, in a sense, with the Duke lacrosse case, another hoax. The rape never happened, but it fed the narrative that male athletes particularly are testosterone-crazed menaces to society. Then came the Rolling Stone University of Virginia rape uh, hoax. Again, fraternities are, are pools of testosterone and dangerous, and it all fits so conveniently. Then we get to Ferguson. And Ferguson, the don't shoot, fed the narrative about how the police are inherently dangerous to minorities. What the report demonstrates, by the way, is not, it seems to me, uh, bias, but disparate impact, which is a different uh, category. And we're, we're going to get into that. One, I, I want to know, you wrote Eyes on the Prize, one of the most important books written, ever written, about the civil rights movement. How do you put together Selma and Ferguson and race in America? What are your thoughts this weekend? Well, Selma is a great point of reference for looking at where we are on civil rights. I mean, you look back at Selma, the people crossing the bridge, Chris, you know, there's a moment when you see Americans willing to stand in the face of violence to bring to reality, you know, the more perfect union, the Declaration of Independence's promise that all men are created equal. Uh, but what you see today is, I think we've lost moral clarity. Uh, because it's moral clarity when you have the Jim Clarks and the Bull Connors beating people who simply want to register to vote as Americans. These were police down south, south in the right. 60s. And, and today, you compare that, we have lost moral clarity. I think what we've got now is civil rights has basically become uh, black people as a special interest group, uh, a key constituency for Democrats, making demands on the system and treat it as such. I think you've lost moral clarity, obviously, when you can't fix the Voting Rights Act in this day and age, 2015, to guarantee that all Americans, instead you see people engage in what I think are efforts to diminish the vote of not only blacks, but Latinos, young people, seniors. Um, and I think you also see diminishment of moral clarity on the part of black leadership in this country when they won't pay attention to some of the issues uh, with regard to family breakdown, crime bad schools, uh, instead always pointing again to the white community as if white guilt is going to carry you to, an, to the next plateau. Just not realistic. So we've lost moral clarity in terms of dealing with slavery, reconstruction, the fight against legal segregation in this country. Well, what you're, it seems to me what, part of what you're saying is it, as hard as that was and as, as brave as those people were, that was kind of easy, pardon the expression, black and white, and now it gets really much complicated. Much, correct. Well, I mean, it's like George said about the narrative. One of the, the unfortunate things about the speech the president gave at Selma, and, and most of it was great. He actually made really good points. It was very rousing. But, you know, he just felt compelled in the end. He had to throw in this argument that there's still a big problem because of voter ID laws across the country. And that feeds another one of these narratives, which is just simply not true. It's not a central focus. If you look at 2012, black voter turnout exceeded that of white voter turnout and in states with the strictest voter ID laws. But that's because so they the had to idea, overcome hurdles. I mean, I but, think what's surprising about this debate is we haven't talked at all about 
the other Ferguson report. I mean, you talk about moral clarity. There's moral clarity in the Ferguson report when they describe instances in which African Americans let me, let are me selected. Just inter by, let me interrupt yes. for a second because I'm going to put. We have some statistics up on on the screen, it's and this is the report about the general. Though. Uh, police department there in Ferguson, please put it up on the screen. Uh, blacks make up or made up 67% uh, of the population in Ferguson, but they accounted for 93% of the arrests there and 88% of cases where there was a use of force. And here was Attorney General Holder releasing the report. These policing practices disproportionately harm African American residents. In fact, our review of the evidence found no, no alternative explanation for the disproportionate impact on African American residents other than implicit and explicit racial bias. And Nira, continue. But exactly. There's disparate impact, but you have instance after instance of police officers with outright racist attitudes policing African Americans disproportionately versus the white population. They have racist emails, they have racist language, and that's why people distrusted perhaps the police. So I agree that there some issues are ones that are more difficult, but these are issues in which we should actually speak with one more united voice. I think the issues out of Ferguson last week, it was it was good that we have a justice department that cleared the police officer. We can have trust in that. But you understand why people were protesting because they didn't have faith in their police because the police department but the specific narrative, the specific narrative after, about Darren Wilson was not true. Okay, there was a specific narrative that wasn't true, and it was good that we have a Justice Department we can trust. But why people were distrustful was because they we've now learned that they have a police department that targets African Americans. And I, I would hope that all of us would see in Selma 50 years later that there are still challenges we face as a country and I thought that's what was so important about the president's remarks was to say you know these are things that we still have to tackle K and I K hope we all Kim, do. Less than a minute. I mean are we going to trust the Justice Department? Again, Eric Holder came out and said, we're not going to stop until we fix these things here. And yes, we should not stop till we fix these things. But does anyone actually we? think that the Justice Department is best positioned to be doing that? As opposed to what, Ferguson itself, in which there are police that are actually, clearly they're not self-policing because they've had racist police officers for a long time doing these things, and no one has cared. No, isn't that why we have a Justice Department? Because we've had a, so we have these laws that aren't being enforced at the Again, local level. Again, I mean, I think that report was actually incredibly complicated. It got into things like productivity quotas and things too. It was tough. To be continued, <laughs> <laughs> and the and the debate will go on. Thank you, panel. See you all next Sunday.